Hello everyone, thank you for joining this webinar. This is the fourth episode of our Behind the Story series, where we speak to our customers about their use of shorthand and the process behind creating their amazing digital stories. I'm Dawn, VP of Customer Success here at Shorthand, and I'll be your host for today. We're joined by two members of the University of Queensland team who will introduce themselves shortly. Michael Jones, Publications Editor, and Zoe McDonald, Donor Relations Officer. Hi, Michael. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining. So they're both going to walk us through the creation of their story, Pandemic Politics. This was nominated in the fifth annual Shorthand Awards. The webinar will last around 30 minutes in total, and I'll go through um, Q&A for majority of that time. But I will try and save a few minutes for maybe one or two audience questions or comments at the end if we have time. If you have any questions at any point, please do use the Q&A or the chat function and we'll keep an eye on that. Now I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers today. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself first? Yes, thanks Dawn. Um, so I'm Michael and uh, I am the a publications officer, at, sorry, a publications editor at the University of Queensland. And um, my uh, main job is editor of our alumni magazine, Contact. Um, so I've been doing this job for around uh, six and a half years. And prior to that, I was a, um, a sub-editor in, in newspapers. Brilliant, thank you. And Zoe? Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Dawn. Um, so my name is Zoe, and I am a donor relations officer at the University of Queensland. Um, but essentially, I'm a content writer is probably a better description of my role. So I am a part of the editorial team at Contact. So I regularly contribute um, to the magazine. And, but I also do a bunch of other copywriting tasks, but uh, yeah, contact holds a special place in my heart. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so we, before we talk about the specific pandemics politics story, can you tell us how long you've been using shorthand um, for and what you're using it for? And Michael, maybe if you wanted to take that question first. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, well, first of all, um, with shorthand platform being, uh, I guess, the, the brainchild of, of UQ alumni, I'm proud to say that um, I think we were one of the a very early adopter of shorthand um, and we've been using it um, since around the end of uh, 2016. Um, for Contact, which um, is the university's alumni magazine, we use shorthand predominantly to tell our, our longer form feature stories. Um, so those stories that have really rich media and, and great imagery um, to, to really, you know, bring those stories to life. So um, I think like, like many um, first time users, we, we tried to do probably a little bit too much and use everything and things sort of became a little bit, um, I guess, uh, overwhelming at times, but I think we've really learned to, to hone um, our skills in, in shorthand and, and really use it now to, to, you, to produce those stories that have um, a lot of impact. And um, so today, shorthand is being used uh, right across um, the university through a lot of different um, uh, marketing um, and, and uh, media teams and in through different faculties and schools as well. And particularly our research editorial team use shorthand for their long form storytelling as well. Um, I guess for me, from a personal um, perspective, um, I'd like to say that shorthand has really sort of given me a a, a new lease of life on, on, um, in my career in recent years, um, coming from a, a print media um, background, uh, particularly newspapers and um, page layout and design. I, I sort of was dreading the, the slow demise of, of print in a way, and, um, but I guess um, using shorthand has really provided that um, really creative avenue to, to tell um, great stories online um, and you can bring those print elements that, which I love um, to life um, through innovation and um, interactive features. Fantastic thank you and Zoe do you have anything to add on that? Um, not much I'm pretty new to um, I, even the contact magazine team but using shorthand so um, nothing much to add, but I, I can just say, yeah, definitely coming into the contact team and seeing how we use shorthand um, is just so creative and it's, it really brings a lot of different stories to life through the, uh, the imagery and, and the design aspects of it. Yeah. 
Great, thank you so much both. So now we're going to start talking about the pandemic politics story. So I'll just pop that on the screen for everyone to see. And what I'll do is I'll probably scroll to different elements of the story just as you're talking as well. So we can look at some of the um, creation elements in there. Um, so firstly, when did you um, start this story and what did you set out to achieve with this content? Um, and um, maybe it's up to you sort of who goes first on this one, but uh, Zoe, maybe maybe you wanted to start on this one. Yeah, I'm happy to start. So um, my role in the story was as the writer. Um, and at the time, so I started writing this, I think, and it was early 2020, middle, early 2020. Um, and I was still a student at the time at UQ. So I was studying a Bachelor of Arts, majoring in international relations and a Bachelor of Journalism. And I think, you know, it was the right time for this story in the sense that I was in the final year of my studies. I was really thinking a lot about what I'd been studying. And, you know, this huge global crisis had just arrived. And I think the story was really the culmination of me applying my learnings, both in journalism, but also in my international relations studies. So essentially the story, if you haven't read it, is just looking at kind of the global political consequences of the pandemic in terms of the kind of balance of power and the different influence that we see countries having. Because um, I think we we were a few months in, so we, we'd seen a lot of commentary about the pandemic and about some of those longer term consequences like public health and economics, but I felt this was an area that I hadn't really read any stories about and we hadn't really touched on, but I think there's any international relations students will tell you this, but there's always learnings and changes in the balance of power in big crises. And so it was really kind of my opportunity to, it's a bit of a, I guess, a passion project for me in that it's, I got to apply my writing skills through journalism, but also my studies. Um, and so I think what I wanted to achieve with the content was A, to do that, but I think also to, I guess, make international relations a bit more accessible. I think a lot of us read political commentary, but I tried to include some of the kind of core ideas in my studies, such as power vacuums and that sort of thing, those kind of core IR principles and include them in the story to just make it a bit more accessible for people who were interested in politics, but maybe hadn't had the opportunity to study it at a, at a higher level. So I think that's probably what my intention was with the content. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, you know, we were thrilled when, when Zoe came to us and pitched this idea. Um, it, I think we'd, um, during the, our, our big lockdown in, in 2020, we, we were really um, leveraging contact as an avenue to, 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 to tell stories about our, um, our COVID heroes in a way, many of our alumni and, and community members who were doing great things to help people in, in need and, and I guess changing their business model of what they do as in their careers to, to shift with the pandemic. But this was a piece that we really got, were able to, to um, take a news analysis approach to, um, which was really important. So um, for me, I guess I, we knew this story was going to be a, a, a strong um, story in it, um, but it also had the potential to be quite provocative. Um, so from an editor's perspective, um, we not only wanted eyeballs on the story, but I wanted people to discuss and debate the content. And one of the pillars of our um, recent editorial review was that we wanted to be fearless in our approach to, to content selection and storytelling, um, as well as to create a place where readers can be part of the conversation with their peers as well. So um, I had no doubt that, you know, we'd get clicks on this story, but um, we also wanted, you know, given that it was gonna be a long and, and complex piece, we wanted the design to, um, to keep those readers scrolling and, and be visually engaged as they as they read. Great, thank you. And um, what were your first steps for putting the story together? And can you walk us through that production process? Um, yeah, I can. Or oh, do you want to start? Yeah, you, to, yeah you start. I can, I'll start because I guess chronologically, I sort of um, yep. I was the first part of the of the story there. So yeah, so I came up with the idea um, and I pitched it obviously. And then I guess the next step was kind of figuring out what sort of format we wanted the article to take because um, I wanted to put a little bit of myself in it, I guess as kind of a commentary piece, but at the same time I was a student and 
I wanted to also be able to leverage the expertise of the researchers and, and you know, the people that I'd learned from for so many years and kind of have this hybrid model of a commentary piece from a student, but also have that balance with um, a lot of commentary from our researchers as well. So we kind of settled on a format of having a bit of an introduction um, by me and then including um, the interviews that I did with the researchers. So yeah, we just sort of decided who we wanted to talk to and we decided to really stick within the School of Political Science um, and International Studies for this one and just really leverage that expertise in the IR space. And um, yeah, so we just decided on that format and I interviewed everyone as an all and I put together a story um, and I kind of just handed over to Michael and said, do something magical with it, <laughs> which they did. It, it looked amazing and I'll never forget opening the story up for the first time and once it had been designed in shorthand and just going, oh my gosh, that looks incredible. So um, yeah, Michael, do you want to take over on the design side of things? Yeah. Um, so I guess there's uh, basically three steps um, that I would like to outline in, in the design process of this story. Um, and that's, um, well, one is image selection. Two is um, deciding on a common design theme. And three is adding a touch of pizzazz or as um, a former editor of mine at the Newcastle Herald used to say, a touch of Vegas um, to the piece. So, um, and I guess this is the kind of step I, steps I take with a lot of the design of um, longer form stories um, as well. So, but it's also important here to acknowledge the work and um, collaboration with our um, graphic artist on this story, James North. Um, James unfortunately couldn't join us today because he's um, on um, annual leave, but um, he's got some notes and talking points for me to refer to. Um, so yeah, step one was the image selection. And, um, and as the title suggests, um, this is a political story. So, um, and, you know, in their nature, political stories in, from a design sense can be quite dry. Um, so, um, and I knew we had to use some images of political leaders here because we talked specifically about America and China. And um, so, you know, I found some, some um, strong pics of, of Trump and, and the Chinese president. Um, and um, from there, I thought, you know, how can we make this a bit different? So um, I've always liked the idea of those political sort of posters, the old fashioned political posters. So we, we tried that effect and it seemed to work really well. Um, so uh, once we found those images of the political leaders, um, I, I spoke to James and, and he went away and perfected the treatment um, with that poster effect. And um, I think that the final result was something based on the famous um, President Obama Hope poster. Um, yeah, so James created these graphics by um, taking a photo, the photos, placing it um, on a graphic background and applying the poster effect to it. Um, he's then taken that image, copied it and applied that, um, I guess the, the Obama, uh, Obama hope effect to those pics. And so he's now got two images and the, the poster versions, um, I guess, transition through the, um, the reveal um, function on, on shorthand as the reader scrolls. Um, so the second step, that common theme. So that texture, posturized, texturized, um, feel that we had, we, we thought that could be a theme that we apply um, throughout the piece. Um, and so the challenge was how to do this. So, um, you know, we, and we, we, we had some great timelines and section breaks within stories. So that's where we tried to added those, those textures to those, to those graphics um, to sort of keep everything in line and, and um, make everything look pretty, pretty similar and, and, and create that theme. And we even to the borders, um, as you can see on the screen now, of the, the um, UQ experts um, that we've interviewed, we sort of added like a bit of a um, you know, textured effect on the border as well. Um, and then the final touch was that, um, that pizzazz element. So, you know, the story was starting to take shape, but, and, um, you know, given the prominence of the piece, um, we wanted to give it something extra um, to, to take readers, to make readers stop and take notice. So, um, that timeline transition, as you may have seen at the start of the story, um, that was a big ticket item for us. We wanted um, to, to make a statement with, with that. So um, using the reveals section again, we, we've gone um, 
you know, I think it, it's quite engaging for the reader. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the, even the, the headline animation at the start with the, the, the spinning um, COVID icons there, um, it's actually a, a late add-on um, and an afterthought almost. You know, we we'd done the 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 headline um, treatment there, and we thought you know having a bold headline um, treatment would be enough. But and um, but then James came back to me and said, "Hey, I've I've done this uh, little animation. What do you think?" And I thought, "Wow, that's just that's really cool." And I think it it just brings everything to life, and it is a bit of a showstopper. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, did you face any challenges while putting this story together? And if so, how did you overcome those challenges? Um, Do you want to take that one, Zoe? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, so I guess from my perspective as the writer, probably the, the challenge I faced was really what I touched on before with the, the hybrid kind of format with the feature story, or sorry, the commentary piece with our tradition, more traditional news story. Um, and so I think it was, yeah, really figuring out the voice of that story, um, and making sure it wasn't all me, but it also wasn't all the researchers. So it's it was quite tricky to kind of navigate, um, especially as a student, it's quite intimidating to write an analysis piece and show your old lectures and worry about them tearing it apart, but they were all, they were all lovely and had some really good feedback. And, um, it turned into a really nice, a really nice kind of collaborative narrative, I feel, between um, not just the researchers, not just the students, but all of us working together as a university. I guess that's, that's the whole point of a university, right, is to teach the next generation, but also offer that expertise to research. So I think that was a challenge, um, but it, it, it th I think it turned out quite well. And I think it, it has quite a, quite a unique um, sort of voice and narrative to it, which I'm, I'm quite proud of. And yeah, I would say that's probably was the most challenging part. Um, Michael, did you want to touch on any design challenges or? Um, yeah, I think um, from a, not just a design, but editing perspective, as Zoe touched on there, um, we did have to make sure we got the balance right so from a, because um, it was a sort of a, an, a, an analysis piece, but also you know, a news analysis piece. So um, getting the, the balance right with, um, with, with Zoe's, um, you know, knowledge as well. And then bringing in the experts was, um, I wouldn't say it was a challenge, but it certainly, um, you know, it was, it, it took a bit of finessing there, and, and, but it, it's, it's worked out perfectly. Um, but also, you know, given the, the political nature of the piece, it was important that we, we tried not to, to show too much, uh, any political bias in, in, in presenting the piece. And, and, um, uh, and also providing commentary on um, the ever-changing COVID crisis at the time. I think we were only um, a couple of months into the the, the pandemic at, the, at this point. So, you know, every, things were changing, especially internationally. So keeping an eye on on what was happening um, across across the world, um, you know, that was was important to, to make sure we got all the all the facts and, and figures up to date. Um, and then being sensitive to the COVID crisis in general. Um, uh you know um a lot of that was is, was quite scary at the time and we didn't want to be seen as um i guess um you know providing you know, adding any fear or stress to people's lives as well so um and the final challenge i guess was um as an edit editorial team was a we'd only all just started working from home and this was the first time that we'd um had experienced working remotely um so this way of, of working was very new um and um you know, a collaboration um, with with uh, me and and James as a designer was was different to what we were used to. We we usually sit pretty close by and we can just turn to each other and and ask, hey, what do you think of this? Or um, I'm doing I'm doing this treatment on this. What do you what do you think? Will this work? And you know, he wasn't there um, to do that a lot, so it was a lot of um, you know uh, emails and and Zoom messages back and forth. And um, but yeah, we got there. I was just going to quickly say, I was going to add before, um, I think we sort of touched on it, but with one of the challenges as well in terms of the, the writing side of the story was um, because COVID was changing, we were only all the time and we were only a few months in. And I think the researchers and, and I were quite nervous about 
they called it crystal ball gazing and um, predicting the political consequences of the pandemic before it happened. You know, we're talking in the piece about the whole kind of fall of the US rise of China style politics. And I think everyone's a bit nervous to put their name on something saying <laughs> it was gonna go one way or the other. So that was, um, that was quite important for me when I was writing it is to make sure we didn't sort of conclusively say, well, this is gonna happen. The US will do this, the so China will do this, you know, that sort of thing. And so really navigating commentary on a crisis as it was happening or before really it had even happened. So, yeah. And what um, what makes this piece different from other content that you've published before? Do you want me to take this one? Is it? I can I can start off, I guess. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't realize at the time because it was my first shorthand piece, but it was one of the first pieces we did, which has become a much more common part of our sort of repertoire contact. But um, one of the first pieces we did where we really positioned contact as a place where you could come for reliable expert or reliable commentary from experts and experts who you know had decades of research in the field and published in peer-reviewed papers um, and yeah so a place where you could come for that and on topical things and and this was the kind of piece where we were responding to something was happening and we had researchers and it was it was really I think quite engaging and I think you know we had a really great response to it and we had it was one of our most read stories of 2020 which was which is really exciting um and it did start a conversation like Michael said we were really hoping to to do that with our readers and a random little anecdote but I was um I got an Instagram message from a girl in high school with because I posted this to my story and she said oh that's so random my dad just sent me this story saying you should read this this is really interesting or you know this is probably not this is an important conversation but something like that so um it did get people talking and it was a bit different to what we normally did and and that's something that we do try and do now and almost every uh, monthly send we do for contact is to have a really strong commentary piece from our experts on something that's happening in the world at that moment so um yeah it's was, it was pretty cool to be a, to be a part of that so Michael do you want to add anything else yeah I mean you I think you you're spot on there um I think, um, you know, contact is always, you sort of had the tr those traditional stories of, of telling our, our really inspiring alumni profile stories and, and some of the great research and, and um, uh, that, that's happening across the university as well. Um, but yeah, as Zoe mentioned at the beginning of the year, um, a, a key goal of ours was to start using contact as an avenue to position our vast array of UQ experts as, as commentators on the big issues. Um, and we thought, you know, why, why can't a UQ um, audience and the community in general come to a, um, to the, the alumni magazine to get, um, you know, that expert analysis on, on the big topics facing society. I mean, the, the news um, media industry is changing so much. And, and um, you know, I think uh, universities play an important role in, you know, alternative source of news um, which is, you know, backed up by, you know, incredible expertise there. So, um, yeah, that was a big, uh, uh, this story was almost a catalyst for, for what we do on a regular basis now um, in, in, you know, we always include a, a really strong analysis piece on um, commenting on, on um, real time issues. And I think it's, it's really um, showing with the engagement that we're getting with our, with our audience now. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I'm sort of nearing the end now. So I'll just uh, make a call to see if there are any questions from the audience and we'll, we'll try and run through uh, maybe one um, at the end as a bit before we finish. Um, but one last question from me. Um, what would be your kind of one tip or learning that you would like to share with others who are maybe just starting out on their uh, kind of journey of digital storytelling? And um, Zoe, I might come to you first on that one, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. So um, I've only recently started getting into the actual design of the stories. I used to just write them, but I um, thought I'd give it a crack. And <laughs> it's really fun. It's great. And I've really enjoyed um, having the opportunity to bring my own stories to life. It was always great watching other people do it, but it's it's been really great to, to start doing that myself. And I think as someone who is just starting out, 
the thing that I found with each new story is the more creative I get with the design, the more, I mean, it sounds obvious, but the more engaging the story is. And, and even things like um, using Photoshop or Canva, or those kind of things to really create some, some kind of, like what we did with the pandemic politics to create quite a different visual than just photographs. Um, I did a piece recently on conspiracy theories and that one was so fun to design because I got to do this background with red string and Polaroids going everywhere. And I think that kind of thing can really add a lot to, to the piece. Um, and yeah, so I think if you can and bring in design more than just the photographs, I think I, I find that really makes a big difference. And yeah, as many images as possible, well, not as many images as possible, <laughs> but making sure you have plenty of images to break up the text. Um, a lot of my pieces are quite long. And so I find having, uh, quite a few images and putting them in you know different places it, it really breaks up the story um so yeah it's probably my learning advice <laughs> thank you and michael how about yours yeah i think uh, my advice would be to um yeah for for people first starting out in in digital storytelling and first starting out using shorthand uh, and it's something i mentioned previously but i think um less is sometimes more and as I mentioned, I think we, we, we fell into the trap early on, on trying to use every feature um, or tell every story um, using shorthand. Um, you know, I think, um, I think uh, yeah, my, my top bit of advice would be to make sure that you have, you know, really quality imagery and, and high quality digital assets to work with. Um, and that's where, you know, you see shorthand come to life with powerful, impactful, um, interactive elements. Um, and finally, I think um, plan how to uh, how you want your story to look um, even before you before you start using the shorthand layout options. Um, I'll often have um, you know study all the all the imagery and everything I've got available to me and, and even map out um, a, a bit of a layout in my head or even on a piece of paper and, and then um, try to bring that to life and and then one final tip is that if you do have the luxury of working um, with a with a design team or a graphic artist, um, really utilize that knowledge. Um, you know, uh, more often than not, um, they will take your story um, or concept to the next level. Good advice. And and we often talk about storyboarding actually when uh, we go through our training sessions. And we've just launched a storyboard notebook. So I'll make sure that you two both get a copy of that very <laughs> soon as well. <laughs> so you can use that instead. Fantastic. Great. Day. <laughs> Great. So we're just coming to the end. We have had one audience question. So I'll I'll run through that because it's a, a really good one. I think um it'll be interesting to hear your answers to that one. So question is um, are there any particular uh, editorial pieces that lend themselves well to uh, the shorthand uh, treatment? Um, Michael, maybe did you want to take that one first? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question. I, I, I think I touched on it before too. It, it's when you've got, I think shorthand works best for me when you have um, a range of images and a range of strong images and also um, some other uh, digital um, assets to use to, to bring it to life. So um, any of those long form features, um, I think, uh, you know, a, a really great test case to, to start with shorthand. Um, things that you can use that might, um, you might want to have, um, you know, different areas to reveal or, or show transitions between, um, you know, before and after pics or, or um, anything else with with really strong data as well. It's a great tool to um, to present um, data and infographics, and um, especially um, we find our, our research stories really come to life by using shorthand to tell to to tell those stories through through um, visual data. Great, Zoe. Anything to add there? Um, yeah, I think I probably I really just have to agree with Michael there, and I find the stories I probably struggle more with to design in shorthand the ones that don't have great imagery because I think if you use too many stock images it can start to look a bit odd so the stories where you have really strong existing imagery um, a little bit of stock imagery is also fine but 
Um, or if I don't have great imagery that's existing, something that has a really strong theme that you can kind of build out in a design perspective. So like I mentioned, that conspiracy theory one was really easy to do because there's a lot of um, sort of very visible visual themes when you think about conspiracy theories. So any stories like that, um, and same with pandemic politics, I guess there's you know the political theme, the COVID theme, there's lots of things that sort of come to mind. But so yeah, any stories that have um, great visual themes in them, um, are great for shorthand um, and things that yeah, have really good existing imagery, I think. Great, thank you so much. Well, we've come to the end of the webinar now. So um, just to mention, we will share a recording afterwards on YouTube and in the newsletter, which we'll share with everyone. If there are any more comments or questions that anyone would like to ask, please do reach out to us at success at shorthand.com and we'll be happy to answer those for you. Um, but just would like to say thank you to everyone for uh, watching the webinar today. Thanks for joining us. Um, and a big thanks so much to uh, Zoe and Michael as well for sharing your, all, all of your insights today. It's been really great. Thanks so much for having us, Dawn. Really yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye now. Bye.